I was going to talk today about a few different areas of the lab uh, which kind of revolve around this theme of how epithelial stem cells enable renewal and regeneration of organs in the adult. And our lab has two main areas of focus, uh, kind of from north to south in the uh, GI tract. One is um, the craniofacial complex, primarily the uh, oral cavity where, where food comes in. And so I'll start by telling you about the dentition and um, the lining of the mouth, the oral mucosa, which is a, a really interesting new area that we've just gotten into uh, over the past few years. And then for the second part, I'll tell you about uh, our work in the gut and, and uh, give you a little sense of how we got into that. And so the, for the first part, I wanna talk about this property that um, many people, including myself originally, were not that familiar with, which is this idea of renewal of the dentition. We often think of teeth as these very static structures uh, because in humans, they have minimal regenerative ability, but many other animals actually have the ability to grow their teeth continuously. So if you look across the animal kingdom, there's at least seven or eight extant lineages um, that have independently or convergently evolved the ability to grow their teeth continuously, like tusks and walruses and elephants, um, rabbits, all their teeth grow continuously. There's even um, a primate, this is a lemur from Madagascar, which has ever-growing teeth. and. Uh, like many of you, we use the mouse as a genetic model for this, so I'll start by explaining to you how the system works in mice, which is that the front teeth, the incisors, grow continuously. And the reason for that is because as the animal is gnawing on the hard material in its diet, it's constantly abrading the tip of the tooth, the, the mineral at the tip, and so that needs to be replaced continuously. And that replacement is driven by stem cells that are present in the most proximal part of the tooth where teeth that have roots, like all of our teeth or the molars, the back teeth and the mice, um, those don't have stem cells, but the ever-growing teeth do have stem cells. And there's several different compartments. There's a mesenchymal compartment um, in the pulp of the tooth, which produces odontoblasts that are similar to osteoblasts. They make a soft mineral called dentin. And then the outside of the tooth has a much harder mineral called enamel, and that's produced by a very uh, specific cell type called an ameloblast, which is probably the most polarized cell in the body. And it makes this enamel, which is orders of magnitude harder than the dentin. And so we've been focused on this epithelial compartment and specifically on this region called the labial cervical loop. There's another cervical loop called the lingual cervical loop near the, t near the tongue. The labial one is near the lip. And the, the labial cervical loop has been known for a long time to have uh, proliferating cells in it. And so when I first started about 15 years ago, we wanted to figure out where are the stem cells in this structure and uh, how are they regulated. And so this is an experiment done about 10 years ago by uh, Chen Ying Li, a former postdoc in the lab, which is a very simple experiment, but it shows you how the system is set up. And um, we're just going to focus on the epithelium. Uh, the mesenchyme is also very interesting, but I won't talk about it for the sake of time today. And so what Chenin did was just a one and a half hour bromodeoxyuridine pulse chase to label the proliferating cells. And what we saw here was that there were three main regions in this epithelium. There was one um, in this most proximal region, which is relatively quiescent, not picking up a lot of label. Then there's these proliferating cells. And then all the cells after this yellow arrowhead are the post-mitotic differentiating ameloblasts. And so when we looked at this, we realized we weren't quite sure exactly where the stem cells were, and that's what I'll tell you about uh, over the next few slides. Um, just to show you how the system works, if she injected BRDU and waited for 24 hours instead of an hour, you can see that the labeling front has moved a couple hundred microns, um, and all of this movement is from cells that were labeled up in here and then advance. Either we don't know yet if it's an active or a passive uh, pushing process. And then by two days, they're moving off the slide. So um, when I was a postdoc, I started working on this, and, and I thought this would be a great system to do various lineage tracing experiments, and so that's what we did for a number of years. This is just one example that was done by um, a couple of former postdocs, Brian and Jimmy, who Brian is now at Genentech, and Jimmy is a faculty member at UCLA. And um, what they were interested in was this gene called BMI1, which is a member of the polycomb repressive complex and is expressed in both embryonic and various adult stem cells. And they saw that it was present in, uh, cells expressing it were present in this proximal part of the cervical loop, and so we obtained a lineage tracing tool from uh, Mario Capecchi and crossed this with the tomato GFP reporter from Li Chen Lo, which is red, and then upon Cree-mediated recombination turns green. And so before we induce the system, all the cells are red, and then um, 
within a couple of days, we see some cells turning green in this proximal part where the BMI1 is expressed. And this was the critical time point, was the one week time point. Because as I told you, the cells uh, only reside in this region for about a day or so before they're pushed out. And so when we see these clones of labeled preamyloblasts present a week after the initial induction event, which is just a single dose of tamoxifen, that's definitive proof that we have labeled some kind of progenitor cell. Um, and then we take this out further, again, with just a single injection of tamoxifen for a month or three months, basically the entire life of the animal, and we still get these waves of labeled cells coming out. So this is really the gold standard way to identify a stem cell in vivo, is to label it a single time and see if it can produce progeny for the lifetime of the animal. So we were really happy with this, and we did a whole bunch of experiments like this for a number of years and uh, found both using candidate approaches and doing um, unbiased screens, a number of different genes that were expressed here and pathways that are important. And, and we thought this was all exciting and great. But what we realized uh, a few years ago was that we still didn't really have a good answer to this question of where are the stem cells, because almost all of the markers, with the exception of this one, LRIG1, which I can talk about if there are questions, because it's a little bit different. But um, all the other markers that we and actually other people have found spanned this fairly broad domain that included both the quiescent and the proliferating region. And so we couldn't figure out, um, actually I'll show you on this next slide, the question that we couldn't figure out, which is whether what was going on in the tooth was more similar to some of the classical models, like what you see in the blood or the hair follicle, where there's this very um, strict hierarchy with the uh, somewhat more quiescent stem cells present at the top of the hierarchy, which produce committed progenitors or transit amplifying cells that then differentiate, um, or whether what we saw was more similar to the um, paradigms that have been emerging in many epithelial systems like the gut or the esophagus that there, in which there don't seem to be any long-term stem cells, but rather just um, proliferating stem cells that will then produce progeny that, that differentiate. And we'll talk more about the, the gut um, and the lining of the mouth uh, in, the, in the second part of the talk. And so um, this was a question that Amnon Sharir uh, wanted to answer um, during his postdoc. And um, Amnon uh, left the lab recently to start his own group in uh, Jerusalem. And we're still collaborating on, on some of these questions, which are essentially where are the stem cells and, and, and how are they regulated? And so. Um, this was a few years ago, and uh, Amnon embarked on a collaboration with Alone Klein in Boston with a lot of help from Pauline Marangoni, a former postdoc and now research scientist in our lab, to do a single cell RNA sequencing of the epithelium of the, the proximal incisor. Um, and so uh, they dissociated and sorted the epithelial cells and then used the, the 10x platform for single cell RNA sequencing. What they found was that. Uh, and I should mention the analysis that we used for this was called SPRING, and this was a program developed by Alone's Lab. And so what Amnon and Pauline found was that there were three main classes of uh, cells in the epithelium, and these could be subdivided into uh, 15 different clusters. What these three classes represented were, so this first class here represents cycling cells, and so this loop uh, when you look at the gene expression, it actually shows cells going in and out of the cycle. Uh, the second class represented the preamyloblast and ameloblast lineage, the cells that are going to make the enamel. And um, we, we knew, based on the uh, BRDU and lineage tracing size, I showed you that these cells emerge from these cells. So the one that we were most interested in was this third class of cells, uh, which we called the non-ameloblast epithelium. And what these represented were all of those cells in the proximal region, which actually have many different subtypes within them. And the question that we wanted to answer was, are there quiescent cells in that region that function as stem cells during homeostasis, long-term stem cells, similar to what you would see, for example, with the, with the bulge of the hair follicle, or is all of the uh, proliferative activity that happens in the cycling cell population responsible for the production of progeny? And so, um, we did a couple of experiments that uh, pointed very strongly to the former hypothesis the, that uh, during homeostasis, all of the activity is based on the proliferating cells. And one of those was um, an RNA velocity experiment, which I'll, uh, I'm showing you here. 
And this approach, for those of you who are not familiar with it, predicts the future state of the cell based on the splice to unspliced mRNA ratio. And so these arrows represent the trajectories um, that, that the cells undergo. And so the loop here of cycling cells, you can see them going out, in and out of the, of the um, cycle. They, uh, as I mentioned, produce the ameloblast lineage, which we already knew, but we also see that all of the arrows from here are pointing in this direction during homeostasis, and there's no arrows pointing back from the quiescent population into the proliferating cells. So this was the first piece of evidence that we don't see any contribution from that quiescent cell population to the proliferating cells, uh, which suggests that they're more of a support cell population, um, or, you know, or doing something else, but, but not contributing to the, um, the differentiating progeny. The other series of experiments that we did, and this was now uh, published um, uh, a couple years ago, so I won't get into it in a lot of detail, but it's summarized in this cartoon, was um, a lineage tracing study done with a double pulse chase of BRDU and EDU. That's summarized here what we found, um, which was that we saw this very clear trajectory that we had known about from the proliferating cell populations into, uh, into the differentiating ameloblast lineage, but we also saw exclusively movement from the proliferating cells back into this quiescent zone and never in the opposite direction. Um, and so together, this suggests to us very strongly that, um, that the quiescent cells do not serve as a stem cell population during homeostasis. However, I mentioned in the title of the talk that I'm going to also talk about plasticity, and this is a concept that we've gotten really interested in. I see Sherry nodding. We were chatting about that a little bit yesterday. Um, and so what we decided to do was injure the system and then see what happens. And so for this, um, Amnon, together with Jimmy, the former postdoc that I mentioned, developed an explant culture system um, in which they can label the cells in vivo and then uh, pop them out and, and watch what they do over, um, over a period of time. And we can do that with various different um, uh, tools. In this one, I'm showing you cells that are labeled with a Notch 1 Cre and Notch 1, um, and, and the same tomato GFP reporter. And not, Notch 1 labels um, this group of cells here called the stratum intermedium, which subtend, these are, this is a uh, cuboidal cell population that subtends the red cells, which are the ameloblasts, and they're thought to provide a support function to feed them ions that they need in order to make the mineralized tissue. Um, and what was amazing during these movies was, if you look at the, at the inset here, that these cuboidal cells will send up these little projections. You can see them, them sending up these little like fingers that almost seems like they're testing what's going on above them, but then they quickly retract them. Um, so I guess they check everything's okay, then they, then they pull them back. Um, but when we give 5-fluorouracil, which is a chemotherapeutic that kills all the proliferating cells and it really kind of wipes out the epithelium, which you can see here, um, then if you look in the inset again here, you'll see they're sending these little projections and somehow, we don't understand how yet, they sense that something is wrong and then they move up and they integrate and from what we can tell, they essentially transdifferentiate and become ameloblasts to fill up that layer. Um, and so we see that kind of behavior not only with these stratum intermedium cells, but we also see that the cells in the proximal part, that quiescent region, um, have, have similar kinds of, uh, of behaviors that they can undergo. So our conclusion from this was that although during homeostasis, the quiescent cells don't uh, have any kind of stem cell function, they, they facultatively can do so. Uh, if you think about plastic behavior as serving as a backup for, um, uh, and to enable repair from, from injury. Um, and I'll just close this section with one slide because I, I know this talk was supposed to be about relatively recently published papers, and so this was the paper that was mentioned in the title that, that we recently published, which we've been using this system now to explore various different um, aspects of uh, regulation of behavior of the stem cells. And so here what we looked at was the role of splicing in epithelial homeostasis. And uh, I'll just briefly say that what we found first in the tooth, and then we also confirmed this in the intestine, was that an important splice factor called SRSF1 is required specifically for the homeostasis of the progenitor population, but not necessarily for the um, for the descendants, and the, the um, mechanism by which this SRSF1 controls uh, epithelial proliferation is by regulating a number of different um, genes that are uh, important to prevent 
um, activation of uh, p53 and p21 and then apoptosis and so this is just one example of some of the the kinds of uh, projects that we're now undertaking to use this incisor system to understand how stem cells are regulated and so with that, I'll, I'll move on to um, the, the second craniofacial part of the talk, which for me has been a really exciting area and something that I've been learning about together with the lab, which is the oral mucosa. And this is similar to the skin, but it's on the inside of your mouth, and it doesn't have uh, all uh, the same adnexal structures like hair follicles and, and sweat glands. It has other ones. Um, but what's really amazing about it is that, as you've probably all experienced, if you bite the inside of your mouth, it heals much more rapidly and without scarring compared to if you cut your skin. And because of these properties, it's been used a lot in tissue engineering and transplant applications. And there are, of course, many diseases um, and, uh, and malignancies that are, that are important in the mouth. Um, and I want to credit Kyle Jones, a former DDS PhD student in the lab who uh, is now a junior faculty member at UCSF. Um, who is an oral pathologist and said, you know, we should really look at the at the behavior of these of these uh, epithelial cells. Um, and so, what Kyle did when he began his PhD work was to write a review article saying what he was going to do. And then it was very cool. Actually, he then went out and did it over the next few years and and, and published uh, his work at the end of that process. And so, like the skin, there's a proliferative basal layer uh, which then moves up and differentiates. And I should mention there are. Um, important differences between the mouse and the human that we're still working through. And another um, important issue to mention is that the mouth is very highly regionalized. Similar to when you think of the skin, there's different skin, for example, on the mouse, on the tail versus the back. Um, in, the, in the oral cavity, there are four main regions. So we're going to talk almost exclusively about the cheek or buccal mucosa, but the palatal mucosa is different. The gingival mucosa um, around the gums is different. And then the tongue mucosa is also different. And this is a, a uh, uh, image from a paper from NIH, uh, just to show you how much more quickly, if you perform similar wounds in the mouth and in the skin, that the mouth heals compared to the skin. And so um, what Kyle wanted to do was first get a handle on the behavior of the oral epithelium in terms of the kinetics. And so for this, he used the H2B GFP system developed by Doina Tumbar in Elaine Fuchs's lab many years ago, in which all of the cells are labeled in green in the epithelium, and then the labeling is turned off, and so those cells that are rapidly proliferating will dilute out the label, and those that are proliferating more slowly will retain it. And so what you can see here is how rapidly this label is being diluted, and this actually is one of the fastest turnover rates in the adult mouse. And then um, since we published this a couple years ago, I won't get into all the details, but I'll mention that um, we did a lot of uh, modeling of the, uh, of the behavior of these populations. And what we found was that um, in contrast to, if you think back about that slide I showed you uh, about the, the blood versus the gut, where the blood has this classical stem cell model, that's often called the invariant asymmetry model, where every stem cell division will give rise to another stem cell plus a differentiating cell. The, the model that you see present in the uh, intestine and the esophagus um, is often called the population asymmetry model because their stem cells will be proliferating. Sometimes they'll give rise to more stem cells, sometimes to daughter cells that are differentiating, or sometimes a combination. And we saw in the oral epithelium, just like in the gut and the esophagus, that the um, population asymmetry model is what holds in this tissue. And so um, what Kyle did then was uh, single cell RNA sequencing to look at the structure of this population. And what he found was that, uh, similar to what I showed you in the, um, in the tooth, that there was this loop of cells uh, coming in and out of cycle, which represented the proliferating cells in the basal cell. Oh, but I should mention here, all of, the, all of these cells that he sequenced were sorted um, from the basal, pop, uh, basal cell layer exclusively. And so we, we see the proliferating cells in the basal layer, but to us what was really interesting was that there was also a large number of differentiating cells present within the basal layer. Um, so these were cells that we had expected to see more in the superbasal layers that were differentiating, but they were already present in the, in the basal layer. And so what we concluded from this work was that, um, as I mentioned, there's this very high rate of turnover, um, and the basal layer actually has a lot of differentiation going on within it, so the cells begin this journey uh, of differentiation much before they lift off the basal layer, and how this is all 
controlled we really don't understand yet but that's something that we're that we're currently looking at is how do they know the balance of um, proliferation and differentiation and how far to differentiate within the the basal layer but um, what all of this initial work that Kyle did prompted us to think about is then what's going on in the stroma that's underlying the um, the epithelium and how is this involved in particularly in wound healing and so this is a, a project that Jesse Cook a graduate student in the lab is working on in collaboration with uh, Mike Longacre's lab at Stanford and so I'm going to show you just some very kind of preliminary data that we have and I'd be really interested in getting people's thoughts about this so when Jesse began this project, um, there was relatively little known about the different uh, mesenchymal populations in the buccal mucosa. And so um, we know that the, me that, that the mesenchymal fibroblasts do a number of different things. They perform functions like production of extracellular matrix, they're important in signaling, uh, tissue maintenance. Um, but Jesse really wanted to resolve the identities and functions of these fibroblasts and then understand how can we explain these differences between wound healing that we see in the skin and the mouth? And so together with uh, Michelle Griffin, a postdoc in Mike's lab, what uh, Jesse did was to perform these wounding assays in both the mouth and the facial skin, and then initially do uh, uh, single cell RNA sequencing to get a handle on these different populations. And so she got a, a nice data set out of this. Um, here what I'm showing you is a combination of both the buccal and the skin fibroblasts. Um, so we have uh, 10 uh, populations. Um, but when we look at uh, which of these populations represents uh, what the origins of, of, of the cells are, what we see is actually there's a fair amount of differentiation between the mouth and the skin. Um, so the, the blue clusters are from the buccal mucosa and the red from the, from the skin. Um, so there's some overlap, but also some very distinct clusters. Um, and so then Jesse and Michelle began to look deeply into the, um, into the subclusters here. And they first did some um, gene ontology, and they found that there were uh, different terms associated with, with different clusters. And um, they're kind of marching through all these, but the one that they're particularly interested is in this growth and regeneration because they want to understand what's controlling the, the healing. And they've focused in on three different pathways. I'll just tell you about one of them now, which is the one that's given us the most interesting functional results so far, which is this GAS6 and axle pathway. Um, so axle is the uh, receptor tyrosine kinase for, for the GAS6 ligand. And what we see is that there are uh, important differences in expression um, in the mouth and, and in the skin. Um, and we see that it's expressed at higher levels in the unwounded buccal mucosa, both in the mesenchyme and in the epithelium compared to the skin. Um, and so this led us to then just go ahead and see, is there any functional relevance to this? Um, and so right now we're just doing the um, antagonist and, and, and agonist experiments, and we're beginning to work on the genetics. Uh, so there's a, a small molecule which um, blocks the uh, activity of, uh, of Axel um, called bemcentinib. And um, when we give it to the unwounded buccal mucosa, you can see that it's already leading to a significant atrophy of the epithelium compared to the control, and then when we give it during the uh, wound repair process, um, this is four days after the, the wounding. You can see there's already nice healing in the control, whereas in the one that's been treated with bimcetinib, there's, uh, there's poor healing. Then when we took the GAS6 protein, the agonist, and we put it on skin after wound healing, um, we see that there's improvement compared to the control in the GAS6 treated one. And so we're thinking that perhaps this could have some kind of therapeutic applications for wound healing uh, in the skin, and so we're beginning to, to look into this further. And so, as I mentioned, this is just very preliminary work going on in the lab right now, but um, Jesse and Michelle are spending a lot of time going through all of these different subpopulations. Um, in terms of the uh, growth and regeneration cluster, we have a couple other pathways that we're beginning to look at, and um, mechanistically, we want to understand better what the downstream targets of GAS6 and Axel are, and so we're, as I mentioned, beginning some of these uh, genetic studies. And, uh, and yeah, and Jesse put this together, this represents what, what the different clusters are involved in. So we have ones that are involved in production of the matrix, various signaling and, and uh, tissue maintenance processes.
And so um, for, the, for the last part of the talk, um, I'll, I'll move a little further down the GI tract into the intestine. And um, I'll start by just a, a minute or two of kind of introduction to the system. Uh, I'm sure all of you uh, in a stem cell crowd are, are familiar, but just to remind you that the intestinal epithelium is uh, one of the, if not the, the most uh, highly regenerative tissue in the mammalian body. It turns over every several days in both mouse and human. And the, in the small intestine, um, there are two main compartments. There are the villi, which are the business end where the absorb, absorption of nutrients and secretion uh, of hormones and mucus happens. And then there are the crypts, which are where the progenitor cells are housed. Um, and so if you slice through here, you get a view like in this cartoon where the um, the stem cells and their descendants are housed in the crypt, and then they move in this conveyor belt-like fashion, similar to what I showed you in the incisor, over the course of a few days, and then they're sloughed off the tip of the villus through a process called the noicus. For many decades, there was a lot of controversy about the identity of the stem cells in the crypt base, and about 15 years ago, um, an important experiment done by Hans Klaver's lab showed that a gene called LGR5, which is a part of the wind signaling pathway, is expressed in these green cells here called crypt-based columnar cells, which were at the time one of the two candidate populations for the stem cells. And work over the past many years has demonstrated um, uh, fairly definitively that these crypt-based columnar cells are the homeostatic stem cells. And so we got into this somewhat serendipitously right around when I was finishing my postdoc through a close collaboration with Fred de Salvage's lab, who's been a mentor and collaborator to me for, for a couple of decades now. And Fred's lab had recently made a mouse that, this was right, right around when LGR5 was, was reported, um, and, and the hypothesis was that eliminating the LGR5 cells would have catastrophic effects for the gut because they were thought to be so important for the turnover. And so that the mouse was a um, diphtheria toxin receptor knocked into the LGR5 locus together with a GFP reporter. And Fred contacted us and said, hey, you know, we're getting some interesting results. You guys want to look at this together? And this was a, uh, you know, a really great initial foray. And then it's what led us to, to continue to work on the gut over the past several years. And um, this here is just showing you uh, the reporter in green in low magnification and high magnification views. In red is a marker of proliferation. And what you can see is that both the stem cells themselves, um, as well as their transit amplifying descendants, are proliferating. So this, the, the crypt-based columnar cells turn over uh, fairly rapidly. So as I said, you know, we had this hypothesis that the elimination of these stem cells by giving the toxin was going to have a catastrophic effect on the gut. And we were really surprised when um, we gave this to the mice. and. Uh, within a day, we saw uh, the stem cells were gone, the LG5 expressing cells were gone. But over uh, at least two rounds of renewal, 10 days, histologically and by many other measures, the gut looked totally fine. Um, and so this was really perplexing at first. And there was another finding that I found uh, really exciting, which was that when we withdrew the toxin, the LGR5 expressing cells rapidly reappeared. So. Here we're giving the toxin for several days. You can see there's no green uh, cells present. And then um, within a couple of days of, of withdrawing the toxin, the LGR5 expressing cells come back. And then within a few days, they've repopulated the base of the crypt. So the gut likes to have these cells there, but it can do fine without them. And I'll just tell you the sort of punchline after many uh, experiments by, by many labs is that the reason that the gut can tolerate the absence of these cells is that there's a lot of plasticity present. And so cells of many other lineages that have begun to commit can actually de-differentiate and repopulate the base of the crypt. Now, there's still a lot that we don't know about this process, but that's sort of the, the short version. And so these experiments got me and, and, and the folks in the lab really excited about trying to understand the plasticity of the gut and then thinking in the long term about if we can understand how the stem cells respond to injury and inflammation, can we then harness some of this regenerative ability to think about treating disease? And so I'll give you one uh, a short example of a, of a story related to this plasticity that we published a couple years ago. And then for the last part of the talk, I'm going to tell you about some unpublished work, which I, again, would be really interested in getting people's feedback on. And so 
uh, th this story began with this question of how infection with worms affects renewal of the epithelium. And we got interested in this um, through a close collaboration with Rich Loxley's lab at UCSF, who's been studying these worms for many years. And um, what we learned from Rich was that we've essentially co-evolved vertebrates have, have co-evolved or, or you know many I guess animals have co-evolved with these vertebrates for all of our history and um, they still infect billions of people in the developing world and virtually all animals in the wild and while they're generally not fatal they can cause some morbidity but often they're they're non-symptomatic and they've been largely eradicated in the developed world but because the immune responses are the result of this co-evolution between the parasite and the host there's an idea that there may be some negative consequences to having eliminated the worms, including that um, being exposed to them early in life as part of this hygiene hypothesis uh, may protect against some immune-mediated diseases. And actually, some patients with conditions like inflammatory bowel disease will actually self-administer helminths in an attempt to shift their, their immune balance. And so the system that, that we used in collaboration with, with Rich was... Um, a natural mouse helminth called Hlygmosomoides polygyrus, which as part of its life cycle, the larva will burrow through, this is, represents the crypts here and the mesenchyme, so the larva will burrow through the epithelium and then live in the mesenchyme for about a week in a, a structure called a granuloma, which is uh, full of immune cells, and then it will emerge um, and uh, live as an adult wrapped around the, the villi in the gut. Um, and this is an image just to show you how rich the granuloma is in these immune cells. And here you can see in this histological section the worm kind of snaking in and out of the plane of the board. And the, from a stem cell biology perspective, what to us was interesting was that it was known for a long time that the crypts directly above the granuloma are hyperproliferative. And so this suggested to us that something either made by the worm or made by the um, immune cells or perhaps uh, based on disruption of the mesenchyme, was causing hyperactivation of a stem cell program leading to hyperproliferation. And so um, this project was led by Eisbrand, a former student in our lab, and Adam, a, a former postdoc in Rich's lab. And what they did was just infect those LGR5 GFP reporter mice that I showed you in the previous slide with the worms, and they got this really surprising result, which was the opposite of our hypothesis which was that compared to the control in which all of the crypts are full of these green LGR5 cells, the cells that are right around the granuloma and the infected mouse actually turned off LGR5 compared to those crypts at a distance. But yet we know that they're hyperproliferative. And so we thought, okay, well maybe something is screwy with a reporter. So we looked at a surrogate marker, which is called OLFM4, olfactomedin 4, which is a target of the notch pathway. And this is by in situ, and we see a similar thing, which is that the crypts right above the granuloma have turned off expression of OLFM4. So this was interesting, and what Eisbrand decided to do was to punch out hundreds of these little granuloma and then sort out the crypt-based epithelium and do a bulk RNA sequencing experiment to compare um, epithelium at a distance from the granuloma with the crypt-based uh, epithelium around the granuloma. And he got this really nice data set, and um, there were a couple of important findings from this. So here's the granuloma-associated samples, and here's the samples that are from the non-granuloma-associated epithelium. And what, so the, these are the genes that are downregulated in the granuloma-associated epithelium. And what he saw was that it wasn't just LGR5 and OLFM4 that are downregulated, but these green genes represent the entire suite uh, that constitutes the transcriptional signature of the stem cell. So they're all turned off. We also see that there's a lot of genes that are upregulated, and um, we're still actually in the process of working through them, but one that we focused on was this gene Li6A, or SCA1, which is expressed in a lot of uh, adult stem cell populations, but um, hadn't really been studied very much in the intestine. And there's a nice antibody for this. And so Eisbrand uh, and Adam stained the infected tissue, and uh, as we predicted from the RNA sequencing, we see that those uh, crypts above the granuloma that we knew had turned off LGR5 express high levels of SCA1, whereas those crypts at a distance that maintain LGR5 uh, don't express SCA1. And so um, now that we have the antibody and the um, in vivo reporter, we could then sort these cells. And as you're probably all aware, if you sort LGR5 expressing intestinal stem cells and put them in matrigel, they'll form structures called organoids. And so we put the SCA1 expressing cells and the LGR5 expressing cells in culture, 
And indeed, the LGR5 positive SCA1 negative cells formed organoids just as we would expect from wild type mice. But the SCA1 positive cells formed these very unusual cystic structures called spheroids. And we weren't sure what these were initially. And then we looked in the literature, and what we saw was that if you take fetal epithelium from the mouse and put it in matrigel, it will form spheroids. And there's actually a beautiful inverse relationship between the age of the embryo and postnatal mouse and its ability to form spheroids. So the older it gets, the more it will form organoids and the less it will form spheroids. So by the time it's fully developed, it forms only organoids and, and not spheroids. And so we then looked both at the uh, gene expression patterns from the spheroids as well as back at our in vivo data set. And what we saw was that in both these cases, there was a um, significant upregulation of genes that are expressed in the fetal gut. And so our um, proposal was that in addition to the homeostatic renewal, which happens from LGR5 expressing cells, and what I mentioned before that can happen when we ablate the LGR5 expressing cells through this dedifferentiation of committed progenitors, that there's also this process that we call developmental reprogramming, in which the entire transcriptional signature of the crypt shifts over from what we see in the adult to something that looks more like the embryo, and this somehow enables better repair or better ability to deal with injury. And then we see that this gene expression program reverts back to the adult program after the, the injury is healed. And so, uh, as I mentioned, I want to uh, close with an uh, unpublished story that, that we're in the process of working on right now. And I want to mention this is all the work of Rachel Zwick, who's a really terrific postdoc, and came up with this idea of thinking about how does the gut vary along the length of the small intestine? And what Rachel is doing is actually revisiting ideas that haven't been thought about in a couple of millennia. So we all learn in, in medical and graduate school that the gut is divided into three, the small intestine is divided into three main regions, the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. But there really are not clear anatomic landmarks between these, and there's not a fixed uh, transition point. Um, and so, Initially, what Rachel wanted to do was ask whether stem cells maintain the regional specialization that we know happens along the length of the gut. But then she realized she needed to actually back up and first define the molecular patterns of regional specialization. And so in order to do that, she came up with a very clever approach, which is to take the um, small intestine, this is now using these, again, LGR5 GFP reporter mice, and cut it, it's about 30 centimeters long, so she cut it into 30 equal one centimeter segments, and then in collaboration with Chris McGinnis and Zev Gartner's lab at UCSF, using their multi-seq barcoding approach, barcoded each of these 30 segments so we could then pull them to sequence and know the origin uh, and um, anatomically uh, along the length of the gut of each of the cells. And so she applies a sample barcode, um, sorts them. There's actually two different uh, populations that she looks at. One is just the stem cells, and the second is all of the epithelial cells, including the stem cells. So what I'm going to show you is actually a combination of these. So it looks like it's enriched in the stem cells just because we, we put the two together here, but we also look at them individually. And then we use the, the 10x sequencing platform. And um, so for those of you who are looking at this, you'll notice in this uh, single cell that it looks like there's a lot of stem cells. And again, that's because we've put the, the two populations uh, together here. And so we see all of the expected cell types. This is the absorptive lineage, the enterocyte lineage, and then here are the secretory cells. And now we can, um, rather than uh, coding them based on their identity, we can color them based on their anatomic origin. And what we see is that the Epithelial cells, and particularly the enterocytes, show this very high degree of zonation, but not all of the cells do. So for example, the tuft cells, you don't see that they're zonated the same way that the enterocytes are, in which there's this very clear demarcation between the proximal to distal origin of the cells. Um, and I'll get back to the stem cells in a second. And so Rachel then worked with Dario Buffelli, a bioinformatician um, who works closely with our lab, to actually um, calculate the positions of the molecular boundaries. And here what she saw, and to me this is one of the most important findings from her study, was that although we often think of the gut being divided into these three classical regions, again defined by the Greeks millennia ago, what we actually see is that there are five main domains. And what is remarkable about the way that this um, algorithm works is that the proximo-distal 
origin of the cells. This, this was, uh, you see these numbers here, this was calculated by the algorithm. We didn't feed the information in, and it's almost perfect. There's a couple of places like here where they're switched a little bit, but but the the identity of the cells is a very important, or the, the, the proximal region localization of the cells is a very important component of their uh, bioinformatic identity. And so um, we saw these five domains, and Rachel has labeled them uh, A through E, and uh, they do not correspond perfectly with the classical anatomical domains. There's some there's some regions of uh, where, where they are more similar, and some and some where they're not. And so she then um, went in and uh, wanted to look more carefully at the regional segregation of these domain defining genes. And the way that she does this is using an approach called a Swiss roll, in which the gut is coiled up and the proximal part is on the outside and the distal part is on the inner, inner part of the Swiss roll. And I'll just give you one example of, um, of what this looks like, uh, but she's done this now for many different genes. Um, and so she sees this really beautiful segregation of these domain-defining genes. This is uh, one example. These are uh, two fatty acid binding proteins. Um, one of them is expressed uh, more proximally, one more distally. Um, but she and, and these two are actually fairly well studied, but she can now go in with many different genes that have not been studied as much in the context of the gut and look at their um, at their regional localization. And in terms of functionally what these different domains do, they seem to be primarily defined based on the metabolism of what they absorb. Um, and so when she then takes these enterocytes, and then um, reclusters them, uh, looking at just the absorptive cells by themselves, into the five domains. They they break up very nicely. And r what Rachel has done is now identified many different pathways that are expressed in each of these domains, and is beginning to look at how um, how uh, both the metabolism affects the patterning and vice versa. Uh, and I think this is really kind of a treasure of uh, of information. And Rachel will is gonna hopefully go on the job market soon and will then be able to use a lot of this in, in her own lab. Um, and so she's doing things like giving them different diets and seeing how that affects the, the patterning. And so this work was, was really interesting for us from the, um, from the mouse, but we also wanted to know whether this carried into other species. And so um, we were fortunate to collaborate with Jay Gardner, a transplant surgeon at UCSF, who enables uh, us to obtain organs from donors that are not being used for transplant. And so Rachel got uh, almost everybody in the lab to work with her as this um, human intestine was brought into the lab. And this is from a healthy uh, donor who, um, whose or other organs were being used for, for transplant. Um, and here, of course, the, the gut is many tens of feet long, so we can't use the uh, entire segment, but she again divided it up into 30 pieces and then just used the first bit of each of those pieces. And of course, also the, the human was not labeled with an LGR5 GFP, so we can here just sort out the crit based epithelium based on expression of um, CD44. Um, and so she did that and she uh, got a very nice data set. This is, um, again, the um, uh, all of the cells together, you can see the progenitor cells here, and then the enterocytes uh, as as they differentiate. And similar to, and, and these were barcoded in the same way as the, as what I showed you with the mouse. So similar to the mouse, there's a very high degree of um, zonation in the um, in the human, and she could then make a similar um, uh, similar heat map to the one that I showed you for the mouse, but now with the human data. And again, we see that there are five metabolic domains, five molecular domains, just like what we see in the mouse. Some of the boundaries are actually identical in terms of the segments. And I should mention here, there's only 15 numbers on the bottom because it turned out that bioinformatically, it was easier to do pairwise comparison of segments. Um, so each one segment actually represents two in the mouse, but the, otherwise it's the same. And so what we see is that the two most, uh, the, the most proximal and the, and the most distal boundaries um, mirror what we see in the mouse, but then the boundaries in the middle actually are shifted over. And so in a way, actually, what, what's to me more surprising is how similar both the domains and their boundaries are. There are some differences that are present, but, but considering how different the human and the mouse are in terms of our diet and our lifestyle, that the patterning of the gut is overall quite similar between these two species.
And so the last thing that Rachel wanted to do is understand um, whether these functional domains are maintained by similarly regionalized uh, stem cells. And that was actually her initial question when she began the project. And so um, when she then looks at the heat map for just the stem cells, what she sees is that here there are actually only three subpopulations. And how these three subpopulations feed into the five metabolic domains is something that we don't understand. Um, there must be some information which is inherently present in the stem cells, but also additional information which is provided by the external environment in some way. And so, right, so there's there's these three different domains here. And um, what Rachel is, uh, oh, and, and similarly that, you know, there are uh, uh, s s subtle differences between the mouse and the human in terms of where the stem cell domains are present. Um, and so then, um, what Rachel is, is now working through, and I'll just give you one example of this on, on uh, this last slide, is to see whether um, we can actually demonstrate that these regional stem cells control the specialization of enterocytes, the, the differentiation of the, of the downstream cells. So she and Dario uh, performed in silico predictions of upstream transcription factors that would be regulating uh, gene expression in the progeny. She's identified a number of candidate patterning factors and is using CRISPR uh, gene editing to perturb this in regional organoids. And this is just um, one example. Uh, this is a gene called CDX1. And so she's deleted CDX1, um, which is highly expressed in the distal or organoids, the domain E derived organoids. Um, and what she sees is that this leads to a shift to a, a gene expression program that looks more like what we see in the more proximal organoids. Now, of course, there's going to be, this is going to be probably multi, uh, multifactorial. There's going to be many different pathways and transcription factors involved in this. So this is just a first step in understanding how identity is, uh, is controlled. And so um, to summarize this last part, what Rachel has found is uh, this regionalization of both the enterocytes and the stem cells and is beginning to look at genetic control of this of this process. And she's identified these five different domains that are present in both mouse and human. Um, there is evidence for regional population of the stem cells. And now, uh, as I mentioned, we're trying to figure out how the regionality of the stem cells uh, directs differentiation of the enterocytes and downstream how that affects uh, the function of the gut, including metabolism. And so, um, I'll stop there. I mentioned the folks in the lab who did the work and um, all of our collaborators who have uh, helped us and also want to acknowledge um, our funding agencies and uh, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions if there is uh, time. Two quick questions. So the first one is on your last story. Um, so the stem cell um, regionalization into three. Um, is that could that also be metabolism driven? Um, or what what do you think is is driving that? And in terms of that uh, regionalization temporal uh, format, uh, is it a, a prenatal event when metabolism is not so much of a cue or post? -natal? Yeah, those are both great questions. So I'll say for the second one about how um, developmental the origin of the regionalization is. So that's something that we're, we're working on. We have um, similar data sets from uh, relatively early in gut development through uh, early postnatal life. Um, and so I don't have a, a clear answer yet. My guess is that, uh, well, or I should say, you know, I think we have some evidence that, there, that, uh, that there's some of the patterning that happens without any external cues. Um, and you can imagine that either there's a reinforcement of this patterning by metabolism, um, so that and that so, you know so that's sort of a or, or you know or a refinement of it. Um, so that's that's something that that we now want to figure out is how um, how much of this is hardwired and how much of it is um, is externally controlled. Um, depending on how you define hard, hardwired, there is evidence, uh, not just from our group, but from other others that, you know, for example, if you make organoids from proximal versus distal, distal parts of the gut and propagate them for a long period of time, they'll keep their regional identity. So it, it's not entirely just dependent upon seeing nutrients. Um, so, you know, presumably there, you know, there's also epigenetic locks on that. And so, yeah, so I think it's going to be really interesting. Um, so, it, and, and then in terms of your, your question about whether the stem cells themselves are informed by, 
nutrients. Um, I, I, you could easily imagine a way that, that would happen because the um, you know as the food is absorbed by the um, by the lymphatics and 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 the uh, into the bloodstream, it's going to be traveling presumably down you know around that region. So I think it's it's very possible that happens. We don't have any direct evidence for that yet, as far as I know, but it's, it's, that's what we're, we're thinking about um, with some of these diet experiments. Can I just ask you to quickly speculate the, the two modules of the stem cell with the one on top in the intestine field and you know, give rise to multiple cell types versus more regional uh, limited span. What, what drives that? You know, I mean, you're at the very unique position because you study both side types. Yeah, I mean, so actually, I would say as of right now, all of the cell stem cells that we're studying, fun, uh, n none of them fulfill the, um, the the invariant asymmetry, the classic model. We we thought that the tooth did for a long time because we modeled it. Uh, I mean, not just us, but the you know, there, it's a small field, but there's other labs that work on this also. Modeled it, the, this work after the hair follicle. The tooth is actually considered an ectodermal appendage that developmentally is very similar to the hair follicle, and so we just assume that it would be, you know, like what you see in the bulge, but it's actually very different in the in the tooth. Um, I, you know, I think this is a really interesting question that you know, I can I can speculate on that that there are different you know, reasons that you might want, you know, classically people have talked about things like certain stem cells, you might want to protect their genomes and have them divide less. Um, I think the evidence around things like the immortal strand hypothesis is not, you know, that's fallen a little bit, I think, by the by the wayside. But in general, you know, the idea that you want to proliferate less in, in certain regions or that you need to proliferate le less um, for example, in the muscle, you know, you, you don't need a lot of turnover unless you have a big injury, whereas epithelia that have to turn over very rapidly um, are, are going to want to have a, a fi you know, just a continuous proliferation. Um, but yeah, to me, it's, it's something that could be a, an exciting project for somebody to compare. If you can think of related systems in which you see these different proliferation behaviors, how that happens, yeah. Uh, you mentioned so many interesting things. I just wanted to ask you about this um, gas six axle interaction you mentioned, because I know in other epithelial junction uh, mesenchymal sites in the body, that plays a really important role. For instance, if that's missing, then the photoreceptors, the, the RPE fails to digest the pinocytose, the outer segments oh, of the Oh, interesting. Arm, I actually, I, I, I haven't looked yet into the... So I'm just wondering, what do you think is happening there? So the signal seems to be coming from the mesenchymal fibroblast to the epithelial cells to tell them to do what? Well, so actually right now we're figuring out because the, the, both the signal and the receptor are expressed in uh, both compartments to a certain degree. So we're trying to figure out, that's why we, we're getting the, the, the mutants in to begin to look tissue uh, in, a, in a tissue specific fashion where, you know, where they're important and what their roles are. Um, you know, the easiest guess, but I don't, I can't, you know, I don't want to promise, but you know, I think the easiest guess is basically they're, they're telling these cells to either proliferate or to secrete ECM, you know, plug up the wound and begin to, to fill it in with, with a scar. Um, based on the, the inhibitor and agonist data that suggests that that's what's going on. But again, we, th these are kind of very preliminary. So we haven't even done the simple things that I'm sure you're thinking about like, have you looked at how well this is, uh, how how th this uh, the the drugs are affecting proliferation, and um, we haven't looked only a little bit at gene expression. So, um, so yeah, so all those things are things that we need to do. Maybe what I'll do is I'll take uh, one or two coming in Zoom. You, you may have alluded to this answer already, but um, the question is from the earlier part of your talk where you talked about. Um, the incisor and mentioned that it's that uh, um, that it's the actively cycling cells that seem to maintain normal homeostasis. The questioner was wondering, what about under conditions of injury? Would the quiescent cells maybe then jump back into cycle? Yeah. So that so that's what I, I very briefly mentioned that we see not only those um, stratum intermedium cells that I showed in the movie, but also we see behaviors in the most proximal part where there's very quiescent cells that can 
Um, so those cells will very rarely proliferate under homeostasis. So the image that I showed of the one hour chase there, you see like one proliferating cell there, you'll see more of that happening. Um, one thing that I'm hoping somebody will be interested in studying in the future is um, there's all these different subpopulations there that we identified by the single cell RNA-seq, and we don't really know very much about them. And I'm presuming that some of them are going to have different proliferative behaviors in response to these injuries. And we actually have a nice model now with the explant culture system. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we do see cells proliferating more. At this point, we don't really know anything about which ones are doing it and what their, what their behaviors are. One last question in the Zoom was asking you to speculate a bit more clinically, do, particularly some of the last work that you did with uh, the human gut and the regionalization. Does this give you any insight into how to approach clinical conditions like short gut or neck or even better transplantation strategies? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I know that, that Rachel, um, the postdoc who did the work, is, is thinking a lot about that. Um, we're just still at a very early stage as a field of thinking about how to use stem cells in the gut for um, repair. Uh, but you can imagine either by understanding the um, how, how this regionalization is controlled, that that would enable you to perhaps target therapies better to, um, to certain regions of the gut that in which you see various conditions being more active in, uh, even at an individual patient level, or that as we move into thinking about using stem cells and organoids for repair, that understanding their identity will be will be helpful because, um, you know, y y you don't know if if putting an organoid uh, or tissue engineered construct that's similar to one part of the gut into another. You know, is that going to remodel, and how much, and can you control that? So I think all those questions are going to be interesting to think about therapeutically. And I think we've exhausted all the questions on Zoom. All right, thank you very much. So with that, uh, let's give Ophir uh, a round of applause and thank him for launching the new academic year.